pretty different from the ones that have come before it and the ones that are going to come after it. They took offense at him. He could do no deeds of power there and was amazed at their unbelief. Everywhere else that Jesus has been and everywhere else that Jesus will go in the Gospel of Mark, there are crowds pressing in. There might be some disgruntled religious leaders. There might be a demon that doesn't want Jesus to get too close. But the crowds, they practically smother him. And those who are in need, they come to him. They bring their friends. They drag Jesus home to their sick daughter. They reach out and try to get any shred of the power that can save. But here, today, Jesus is not welcome at home. Jesus is not welcome where his power seems to be threatening. The people in his hometown are the opposite of those crowds that are pressing in, so aware of their need for Jesus. And we hear that for Jesus, in this place where folks don't feel like they need him, nothing can be done in that kind of situation. When we're so sure of our position and power and capability that we think we don't need Jesus. That's the truth, isn't it? We read the Bible, but it reads us, and it reminds us, and it tells us who we are. And so often, we think we don't need Jesus. We might roll our eyes, at least at first, at this hometown crowd who has the presence of God incarnate in their midst and says, I'll pass. But the more we think about them, the more we might recognize ourselves. If they were to act as if God was actually at work in Jesus, that would threaten the structures of honor and power and um, importance that are already there, right? We know this Jesus. We know where he fits in the hierarchy. And if he were to somehow move up and jump to the top, why, everyone else has to move down. And that's not a comfortable feeling because in a community where we feel like there's a limited supply of honor and of reverence and of respect and there's not enough to go around. Well, if Jesus gets some, someone else is losing out. Now, there wouldn't need to be a limited supply of honor and respect, but we act that way all the time, don't we? So you can imagine these people trying so hard to act fine to look fine, because admitting their need to him, uh uh-uh. Everyone else, he's a stranger. In these other towns, they can come running to him and bear their souls and share the wounds that are so embarrassing that they, they would never say a thing to anyone else, but to Jesus they can. In this situation, oh, it would be mortifying Asking something of this man, that would be humiliating. It's much easier to honor a stranger than to tell the truth to that snot-nosed kid who grew up around the corner and is too big for the britches that you remember. It sounds silly, but that's how we operate so often, isn't it? Sin always curves us in on ourselves. And in our particular context, in our culture, We are primed to believe the lie that we do not need Jesus and that we are fine, right? We live in a culture where appearing to need something means you've already lost. This is the land of the rugged individualist. I have pulled myself up by my own bootstraps, and I'm going to conveniently ignore all the people who helped me get to this point because I did it myself, so so can you. We live in a community where seeming capable is everything, right? There's not room for pain or for suffering. We're going to be fine. On the surface, we're going to be really, really fine, and we're going to be so fine that our knuckles turn white. I read an article recently about um, someone who had experienced a, a sort of major abdominal surgery in America and then in some other context, both sort of developed uh, medically advanced cultures. And in America, she said, you know, I was given some serious pain medication and I was expected at work in in two days. In this other place, I don't remember where it was, I was given Tylenol 
told to drink some tea and lay in bed, you'll probably need about two weeks. We do not have room to experience pain, to give time for healing. Nope, we're going to just, we're going to be fine, right? And we're not given a choice. You will be fine. Your boss is expecting you. We tell ourselves the lie that our land of opportunity has a level playing field all the time because if we were honest about the tilt, I'd have to face how I benefit from that, right? It would challenge my belief that I am a self-made woman, that I can take credit for all the things that have put me on my feet in this time and this place. We are a culture that seems to be more about making ourselves great than it is about making things right. Where we will do everything we can to paper over anything that makes us seem weak or vulnerable or just even admits our limitations. I am fine. We even live in a place where gentleness and kindness are, are suspicious. They might be read as a manipula manipulative lie, or they might be read as sort of pathetic and pitiable. I was, uh, had the fun of finally getting to see this Mr. Rogers documentary that I've been waiting two years for, and there was this moment where folks around him talked about the push that he got from folks, some of whom loved to spread the story that he was secretly a Navy SEAL who was, you know, an excellent assassin, because we couldn't possibly believe that someone is that kind and gentle and is both on the surface and in reality the same person. Or that he was pathetic and pitiable and really just sort of good for a parody. Because, I mean, honestly, kindness and taking children seriously, pfft, we are so sure that we do not need what Jesus has aren't we? Even those of us who gather here who say with our words that we are anchored in this love of God, right? That's what we're here for. The truth is most of the time I am going to try very hard on my own to do whatever it is before I even begin to consult or lean on or live into the love of God that is there offered in Jesus. I'm going to try myself first, and I suspect that you are going to do the same time and again, because that is how we are tempted to operate all the time. We read the Bible, and it reads us. We don't need Jesus. The good news is we read the Bible, and it tells us who we are, and then we read the Bible some more, and it tells us who God is, doesn't it? And this goes back and forth and back and forth. Paul hears, my grace is sufficient for you. Power is made perfect in weakness. So Paul says, I'll boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. Paul loved lists. For the sake of Christ, for whenever I am weak, then I am strong. While we are so busy being afraid of vulnerability, or rejection, or weakness, or failure. Here's the thing. Jesus goes first. Jesus goes first. Here he is this morning in our reading, leading the way, walking into a situation that makes him look weak, that makes him look vulnerable for the sake of love. Those few healings apparently weren't very impressive to Mark, right? As he's writing this story, Jesus did nothing. Well, yeah, he healed a couple of people. But to those people, had Jesus not stopped, how different their lives would be. And because he stopped, how different their lives are. Jesus walks into that community. And then Jesus keeps walking and keeps walking. And on that walk to the cross, he becomes more and more intimate with that list that Paul gives. Weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. Jesus goes first. God's love in Jesus goes ahead of me into whatever impending disaster or failure or sorrow is currently keeping me up at night. Jesus' love walks ahead of us into the hospital, into that terrible meeting at work, 
into that conversation about how this relationship has gone from love and care to something else entirely. Jesus goes ahead of you. In Jesus, God and God's love walk ahead of our neighbors that suffer injustice, walks ahead of those terrified children who have been torn from their parents, going first all the way to suffering and to death so that it can, he can expose the lies. The lies that we tell ourselves about what power looks like. The lies that we tell ourselves about what greatness is. Jesus goes first to free us from all of that. Jesus pulls us out of the grip of sin and death all while the, while the while we're saying, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm not dying. My grace is sufficient for you. Power is made perfect in weakness. Jesus is God's power, made perfect in weakness. The cross is our sign that nothing, not the worst this world can do, not the worst our lives can bring, or the worst I can do and you can do, nothing is beyond the power of Jesus who's gone ahead of it and through it all. That's who God is, right? Grace that is sufficient for all. At the youth gathering, we had a, a wonderful speaker who, um, I'll try to, to post on the, on the church Facebook page, who, who again and again had this beautiful refrain for the depths of his life and for all the depths that we find ourselves in. He said, there's grace for that. There's grace for that. There's grace for that. Scripture tells us who we are. It tells us who God is sufficient, all-sufficient grace. And then it's back to telling us who we are again. So here is Jesus, after this seeming failure in his hometown, sending out the disciples. And he's sending them to do big things. These are fishermen. They are not healers. They are not demon wranglers. And yet, that's what he's sending them to do. And he tells them, hmm, don't take anything. No. And then he follows it up for instructions for when they fail and when they're rejected. I don't think any of those details are accidental. Jesus calls us to share his work in the world, and there are no guarantees of success, at least not by the ways that we measure success. Jesus calls us to big work, beyond what we can imagine doing. Forgiveness, peacemaking, Justice, these are big words, and they're in our hands. Jesus entrusts this ministry to us. And, you know, we don't feel equipped. We don't feel like we've got everything with us, even on our best days. But more often than not, that work is going to hit us when we are not on our best day. The opportunity to forgive doesn't usually come when I've got all of my best emotional wellness around me. No, the opportunity to forgive comes when somebody's done something that's really hurting. And yet, we hear, my grace is sufficient. Power is made perfect in weakness. Jesus is not sending the disciples out to be strong. Jesus is not sending me and is not sending you out to be strong. We are being sent to be weak, which makes no sense, but it's God and it's not about us. When we're weak, we know we need Jesus. When we're weak, we know in our bones that we need Jesus. And that's when there is room for God's mighty and powerful love, God's upside-down way of working in the world to have free reign in us, in our lives, and in our communities. So as we go out this week, we've got a couple of challenges. The first is simply to recognize our need for Jesus and to stop pretending that we're fine all the time. The second is an invitation to see the power of God in Jesus on the cross. To see that the, the, rest, the cross and resurrection of Jesus is for you, is sufficient for this, whatever your this is, that is looming or weighing or tearing you apart. And then finally, the invitation is simply to be open to being sent out into this world with empty hands, with an unsure heart, but trusting that the power of God is at work because it's not about us. And God's grace is sufficient. Thanks be to God.